Okay, well, good morning to anyone who's online already. And if you want to start posting questions now, that's fine. Uh, Hugh's available for about 15 minutes before he starts. And uh, then we'll officially start at 1045. So here we go, Hugh. Let me see if I can open this question up. Uh, are you ready for a question, Hugh? Yeah, sure. Go for it. So Stephen says, in early January 2020, much of the astronomical community was excited by the release of data from the Gaia Observatory concerning the discovery of the Radcliffe wave. Radcliffe wave is thought to be an area of highly concentrated stellar nurseries in the Milky Way. I've not heard anything more about it since then. Can you tell us what this discovery means? Well, the thing about Gaia is that it's able to make uh, accurate measurements of the distances uh, to different stars. So we're actually getting a more accurate picture of the structure of our galaxy. And uh, that's actually being used too for uh, exoplanetary research. And we, we've been talking about exoplanets the last couple of weeks. And uh, one reason why we got high quality data is thanks to Gaia. Uh, but this particular uh, Radcliffe thing is about the fact that they have found a gaseous nebulae where they see aggressive star formation taking place. Um, we do have uh, over a hundred such gaseous nebulae in our galaxy. I mean, probably the one that people are most familiar with is the Orion Nebula. Uh, you can actually see that with a naked eye if you're not in too large of a city. And uh, that's where new stars are forming. But this is a place where there's actually uh, significantly more aggressive star formation. And uh, I think the reason why this hasn't gotten more attention since, I mean, gaseous nebulae where stars are forming uh, that have been well studied and are fairly common. Uh, probably the one that late people are most aware of is a series of photos uh, released by NASA that goes by the interesting title, Pillars of Creation, and basically shows these uh, gas pillars that are illuminated by newborn stars where additional stars are forming. Uh, if you have not, not seen that, uh, you can go online and just put in pillars of creation. It should pop right up. It's quite a beautiful uh, image to look at. Very good. Thank you, you. Um, Doug from Monrovia, our friend, says, According to my reading, there are different types of energy, and energy can be considered to be even more than just a conserved quantitative quantity energy uh, necessary to perform tasks. The law of conservation of energy states that, quote, energy can be converted in form but not created or destroyed. First law of thermodynamics also says this. So his question is this specifically, what is energy? If it cannot be created or destroyed, how is it true that God created it? To just state to unbelievers that God did it miraculously seems to me to beg the question, and one might even say it is dodging the question. Could you respond to that? Yeah, the conservation law applies to matter and energy once it exists. So uh, once you've got the universe coming into existence, the matter and energy uh, total matter and energy in the system cannot be created or destroyed. So that's an important caveat. We're talking after the cosmic creation event. A second important caveat, this does not apply to dark energy. Uh, dark energy is not electromagnetic. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't emit heat. Uh, it's energy that's embedded in the space surface of the universe. And so it doesn't participate in the thermodynamics of the universe. Uh, however, it does have the effect of uh, stretching out the space surface. As the space surface becomes bigger and bigger, that dark energy embedded in the space surface becomes progressively more powerful uh, to expand the space surface of the universe. And as the space surface expands, everything attached to the surface uh, expands away from different objects as a result of that. And uh, that actually makes up 70% of the total Thank stuff you. of the universe. Here's a question I've been wondering about uh, from Chris Thompson in Anchorage, Alaska. Hugh, could you please talk about the dangers of the, of the deployment of the Starlink to the astronomical community? I'm not sure I understand it. 
Well, I'm not sure what he I means. Think he's talking about Elon Musk's. Uh, um, oh, okay. Uh, what Starlink Elon Musk is talking is the, about. Uh, yeah, I know what it is now. Yeah. And what he's proposing is to actually send tiny spacecraft from uh, Earth uh, to the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, and in particular to go to Proxima Centauri and actually uh, make some measurements of the, of the planet that's orbiting Proxima Centauri. This has got a lot of excitement because it's the closest planet outside of our solar system. And there's been speculation that maybe it has the characteristics that might permit the existence of bacterial life. So Elon Musk is saying, let's go there and find out. And, uh, you know, it's four and a half, uh, four and a quarter light years away. So you're going to have to go relatively fast to be able to do it in any short period of time. So he's suggesting sending spacecraft at 10 to 20% the velocity of light. Now, when you send spacecraft that fast, even things like electrons and protons in the interstellar medium uh, work to destroy your craft. So his strategy is we're going to send spaceships that are no bigger than 10 centimeters across. And we're going to send a thousand of them all at once. And uh, we know that maybe half or more of them will be destroyed on the trip uh, to, uh, you know, Proxima Centauri. Uh, but the ones that remain will be able to get the measurements uh, that we want. Uh, it's interesting and it just shows you that the idea of sending humans uh, to another planetary system is completely out of the question because now you need a big spaceship and with a big spaceship, that spaceship is bound to be destroyed if you send it at any velocity greater than say 1% the velocity of light. And if you're talking only 1% the velocity of light, it takes you a really long time to get there, more than the lifespan of an astronaut. So I've written about this uh, actually a couple of decades ago in my book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, why we can be certain that we're not being visited by physical beings from another planetary system. The distances are so great and the dangers are so great going from there to here that uh, that's not possible. Matter of fact, I put up a blog uh, just uh, a few months ago now on why it's not going to be possible to send humans to Mars. Once you get outside the magnetosphere of the Earth, uh, you're exposed to deadly radiation, which will destroy your uh, intestinal tract uh, within three to four months. You, I think the, uh, this is Mark Perez, the Starlink that Elon Musk is dealing with is a constellation of small satellites to be used to make sure that you can have internet anywhere in the world. And it would oh, be okay. a large number of these satellites. And the question I think is, how will that affect the astronomical community to have all of these uh, satellites floating around right, in our, right. near Earth orbit? Yeah, well, a number of my fellow astronomers have been writing editorials and science journals saying, we need to have some way of controlling how many satellites are up there and how reflective they are, because this is going to impact astronomical observations. As it is, there's about 10,000 satellites orbiting the Earth, and already uh, it is sufficient that uh, it constrains astronomical observations. So the idea of sending up tens of thousands or more uh, is not a pleasant thing to consider if you're an astronomer. And, you know, people said, well, you know, we could just ship those astronomers to the backside of the moon where the satellites won't be a problem, uh, but that's not an economically effective way to go, and especially when you think of how much money is being invested in these gigantic ground-based telescopes. And we're not just talking optical astronomy being affected. This would also affect, uh, you know, uh, radio astronomy and infrared astronomy as well. Thank you. Um, Juan is asking, he says, I would like to know your position on tithing, I think is what he's asking. Why is, it, why is there so much controversy about it these days? Well, it's just like there's a lot of controversy about paying your taxes. I mean, yeah, you know, it's money that goes out of your pocket and uh, you don't actually have all that control over it. Uh, with tithing, you do have control in the sense that you get to determine uh, which church or ministry uh, gets that tithe. Uh, I actually spoke about this in the Paradoxes class 
oh, I guess about uh, 30 years ago, basically making a point, we need to understand tithing in the context of four other means of uh, charitable donations that are mentioned in the New Testament. In other words, a lot of people in the church, I think, got the wrong idea that tithing is the limit of what the Bible encourages us to donate. Uh, the tithe is basically to support the ministry of the church. And uh, people have said, well, you know, if I give 10% of my income to the church, churches today aren't like they were uh, in the first century, where they were basically involved in giving to the needs of the poor. They were involved in sending missionaries out. They were involved in uh, supporting, uh, you know, people who were uh, bringing others to faith in Christ. Uh, they were actually investing in uh, ministry projects that would be able to extend the mission of the church. So I think it's a fair criticism that churches today are not doing all that the New Testament really commands them to do. And so there's been a, a controversy, okay, uh, can I give part of my tithe uh, to nonprofit organizations? And, uh, you know, my feeling is that uh, we need to encourage churches to step up and do everything that the New Testament commands them to do. On the other hand, we need to realize that with the 21st century, uh, technology has basically forced us to expand the ministry of the church outside of just these congregations and brick walls. A lot of ministry today is not brick and mortar anymore. As a matter of fact, the New Testament makes it clear that church is not a building. It's a body of people. So I think the Bible gives us a fair amount of freedom and how we can distribute our tithe. Uh, but I'd also say uh, your giving should not just be limited to the tithe. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about praise offerings, uh, where if something has happened in your life or God has blessed you in a clearly supernatural way, you need to express your gratefulness by giving an extra gift. And personally, I find the most uh, impactful uh, donation is what's referred to as a sacrificial gift where you're facing a crisis in your life uh, or a crisis in your family or your organization or whatever. And uh, you actually make uh, a significant sacrificial gift uh, uh, for another cause. And uh, the Bible tells us that God will bless that. And my wife and I have personally seen that happen. When we do make a sacrificial gift, it's amazing uh, how God can step in and do amazing things. And the bottom line is, with each mode of giving, God intends to repay with a special blessing, not necessarily a financial blessing, but you will get a blessing. And the bottom line is God doesn't want you to uh, miss out on these blessings that you'll receive. You know, God loves a cheerful, cheer, cheerful giver, and God intends to bless uh, cheerful givers. And so, yeah, if you're feeling, gee, I have to give this tithe, that's not the right attitude. It's right. like, you know, we really need to be thinking, wow, uh, this is something I can really invest in. I know God's going to use it. And the Bible actually promises God's going to bless us. On the other hand, often God blesses us in ways that is entirely unexpected. So I'm against this idea of prosperity giving, you know, where you give, say, $1,000, and you've got these preachers saying, if you do that, God's going to return $10,000 to your bank account. That's not what Scripture says. You will be blessed but you might be blessed in a completely unexpected, unintended, non-financial way. Uh, but that's going to be even greater than the financial blessing. Now, does he bless financially? He definitely does. But his blessings are not limited to that. Seems to me, Hugh, the best way to look at it is uh, it's all God's in the first place. And what does he want me to do with what he has given me? Right. He wants us to be stewards of what he's uh, provided for us. But yeah, if you want to go back some 30 years into the uh, recordings of paradoxes, you can dig that out. Don't ask me exactly where it is. I don't know. <laughs> but it did get recorded. Well, it's 1045, so let's get started with the talk. Um, okay. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Hugh Ross's Paradox class. Um, personally, I've been in Montana for a few weeks, which is the state that's the least effective affected by coronavirus, so it felt like going back in time. Um, if you see someone with a mask in Montana, it looks very strange. And to come back here was quite a shock. Um, 
but I'm very glad to be back and taking part of this in this. So Hugh, why don't you open us in a prayer and we'll get to your, get to your talk. Sure, Father in heaven, we thank you that this is your day and help us to celebrate it. Thank you, Lord, for establishing the Sabbath where we can take regular time to focus on the most important issues of life. So Father, pray you bless uh, this next hour and 15 minutes. And uh, Lord, uh, may we all be open to receiving uh, more truth, uh, more life, and more love from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Well, before I get started, uh, Ross, I just want to say your timing is really optimal because a news story just came out uh, predicting that Montana probably will be one of the next uh, COVID-19 hotspots because of uh, how lax people up there have been. So I think you left at just the right time. <laughs> so, and that's not the only state. Idaho is also on that list. I mean, the right. states you think would not be affected, but the problem is they've been... Uh, so little affected that they've not been sufficiently cautious. So the CDC is actually predicting they will be the next hotspots. So meanwhile, we're still a hotspot here in LA uh, County. All right, let me uh, share screen so that you can all see my visuals. Okay, you should all be seeing my first slide. And this is a slide I show with every uh, class when I begin the teaching. Uh, so that way you know it's things are started. And again, just to remind you, if you don't get to ask your question uh, during our time today, uh, all of our scholars, not just me, maintain a Facebook and a Twitter page uh, where we do take people's questions. And if you haven't signed up for it already, uh, we do have a 24 seven YouTube channel you can subscribe and you'll be notified of all the latest uh, videos uh, that uh, we post on that site. And of course, you can contact any of us through reasons.org. Uh, and uh, these are a couple of books I've been recommending for the series we're doing. Weathering Climate Change is my latest book and you can get a free chapter at reasons.org slash Ross. Matter of fact, you can get a free chapter of almost any of my books at reasons.org slash Ross. I gave this verse last week. Uh, you know, anytime you see a verse in the Bible that uh, is in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, that's a verse that you should pay attention to. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Basically reminding us this planet in which we live uh, has been supernaturally designed to be able to sustain a huge abundance of life a huge abundance of human life and non-human life. Everything we see on planet Earth is something that's been personally and supernaturally designed by our creator. Uh, but what we've been doing these past few weeks is going over the research I've been doing for my next book, a book on the interior designs of our super galaxy cluster, our galaxy cluster, our galaxy group, our galaxy. You get the idea. And I got one a chapter, actually a couple of chapters, that talks about uh, the exquisite designs of the architecture of our solar system, the big bodies like the planets and the small bodies like the moons, the asteroids, and the comets and the dust that exists there. And uh, what we were sharing last week is just the supernatural designs we see in Jupiter, which allows us to make a paraphrase of that passage that we see in Psalms. Uh, Jupiter is the Lord's and everything in it and all who depend upon it and how the same thing's true as Saturn. Saturn is the Lord's and everything about it and all who depend upon it. And you can get the recording of last week's paradoxes where we talked about just how special uh, the gas giant planets are. Because uh, when we look at exoplanetary systems, uh, literally thousands of these big planets have been discovered but none of them come anywhere close to the characteristics of Jupiter and Saturn, the characteristics uh, that are crucial to make advanced life possible in our planetary system. And I'd like to extend that this morning and uh, just make the point that Uranus and Neptune, same way, uh, Uranus and Neptune are the Lord's 
and everything about them and all who depend upon them. Uh, and you know, astronomers divide the big planets into two categories, the gas giants and the ice planets. And as you mentioned last week, uh, these ice planets are all smaller than Saturn, but more than 10 times the mass of the Earth, somewhere between 10 and 90 times uh, the mass of the Earth. And likewise, uh, in spite of the fact that astronomers have found over 4,200 uh, planets outside of the solar system, we're finding nothing that comes anywhere close to the characteristics of Uranus and Neptune. And once again, those characteristics are highly fine-tuned to make advanced life possible uh, here on planet Earth. We can also make the same point about Mercury and Venus. Mercury and Venus are the lords and everything about them and all who depend upon them. <coughs> uh, we'll get into this and the fact that uh, Venus and Mercury play critical roles in breaking up the mean motion resonances that inevitably are generated by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And it's important that those mean motion resonances be broken up in order that the orbit of the Earth can be stable enough for advanced life. And we can also state that Mars is the Lord's and everything about it and all who depend upon it. And today I'm going to try to get into what's called the Mars problem of the solar system. The Mars problem is that when we astronomers try to come up with models to explain the origin of the solar system, uh, those models all wind up predicting that Mars is going to be about one and a half times the mass of the Earth. And if it were one and a half times the mass of the Earth, there's no way advanced life would be possible on planet Earth. A planet that massive and that close to the Earth uh, would bring about orbital disturbances for the Earth that may not rule out bacterial life, uh, but it would rule out advanced life. And so the Mars problem has been, how can we explain uh, the origin and history of the solar system in such a way that we get a tiny Mars uh, rather than a Mars that's actually about 50% bigger than the Earth. Uh, as it is, Mars is one-ninth the mass of the Earth, small enough mass that is not a threat uh, for bringing about orbital instabilities. And incidentally, that small mass, it can join Venus and a Mercury in breaking up those mean motion resonances. Something that's brand new is we now know that even our moon orbiting the Earth plays a critical role in breaking up those mean motion resonances. We need Mars, uh, Venus, and Mercury, and our moon to be exactly the way they are in order to make possible advanced life on planet Earth. All right, this next slide uh, shows you uh, the uh, solar system array of planets. Uh, you may not be able to see them, but it actually shows us four small rocky planets. And uh, what you see here in this map, the sizes of the objects are to scale, the distances between them are not to scale. If we tried to make those distances to scale, uh, then you'd have the uh, four uh, rocky planets jammed tightly together. But in between the Sun and the Jupiter, uh, you can see these little tiny dots, and uh, that's uh, Mercury, Venus, uh, Earth. And Venus and Earth should show up for you in the visual, and you've got Mars. So you have the sizes here of the scale. And incidentally, uh, the distances are roughly to scale once we start talking about Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So those are roughly to scale, but once you get interior to Jupiter, it's not to scale, but it gives you an idea. And I mentioned this briefly at the end of uh, last week, uh, the ice line. Uh, the ice line is that distance, uh, and, okay, just so you know, in this case, uh, the, the uh, objects uh, are roughly to scale and uh, yeah, they're still to scale here, um, but not the separations. But the ice line represents that distance from the star uh, where it's now cold enough that volatiles will freeze. Cold enough that water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, uh, these would be things that be uh, in gaseous state uh, here in planet Earth except for water. <coughs> 
at the ice line, they all freeze. And that happens when the temperature is about 150 degrees Kelvin, that is 150 degrees above absolute zero. And what's significant about the ice line, once you get beyond the ice line, when planets form, they're gonna be able to accrete huge quantities of these volatiles, because these volatiles are basically gonna be uh, frozen uh, dust grains, uh, frozen little rocks, and uh, they're gonna be able to be gravitationally accreted onto the new forming planets. So it explains, for example, why Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune uh, are largely composed of volatiles. Uh, whereas when you look at uh, uh, Mars, Earth, uh, Venus, and Mercury, uh, they're largely volatile free. I mean, the Earth has got a very thin atmosphere and a very thin layer of water, uh, but it is the most massive of the rocky planets. Uh, but when you look at the rest of them, uh, very few uh, volatiles. Uh, but once you get past the ice line, you're gonna get enormous amount of volatiles because they are in frozen form. Okay, this next slide, I think, yeah, this one shows you the objects are not to scale, but the distances are. So basically makes a point, and uh, I'm gonna use a term astronomical unit. That's an astronomical uh, measuring uh, yardstick. And that's the distance, the orbital distance between the Earth and the Sun. It's about 92.9 million miles. That's one astronomical unit. And uh, Jupiter is situated at 5.2 astronomical units. And again, I've made everything to scale here. The ice line shows up at 3.1 astronomical units. So anything beyond about three times Earth's distance from the sun is a place where these volatiles will freeze and be able to accrete onto the new forming planets. So again, it explains why you got such large planets beyond the ice line and such small planets interior to the ice line uh, in our solar system. But uh, here's the problem that when we look at these exoplanetary systems, we see that the vast majority of the gas giants, the ice giants, and a new category of planet called the super Earth. A super Earth is any planet that's more massive than the Earth, more than say about 1.2 times greater than the mass of the Earth, uh, and 10 times the mass of the Earth. As I mentioned in previous uh, classes, uh, there is a large abundance of such planets in exoplanetary systems. However, when we observe these exoplanetary systems, these big planets are all interior to the ice line. In fact, they're way interior to the ice line. The vast majority of these bodies are orbiting their host stars interior to the orbit of Mercury about our star of the sun. So, you know, how do you exp explain planets as big as Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune orbiting so close to the host stars. And uh, the discovery of these exoplanetary systems basically led astronomers to say, okay, when these gas giant and ice giant and super Earth planets are forming beyond the ice line, they're forming in a protoplanetary disk that's loaded with gas and dust and small pebbles and planetismals. Those are bodies about a kilometer across or larger, uh, typical of what we see in the asteroid belt. And uh, what they were able to demonstrate through computer modeling is that these protoplanets are gonna gravitationally engage the gas, the dust, the pebbles, the rocks, the planetismals, and an engagement causes a transfer of angular momentum. Uh, basically what happens is that these protoplanets lose angular momentum, which causes them to move towards the ice line. And uh, they will move all the way in to the host star until that point uh, where there is no gas or dust or pebbles or rocks. And if you get close enough to the host star, uh, the radiation from the host star uh, will either blast this stuff away or the gravity of the host star will pull it all into the host star. Uh, because there was a time when astronomers were saying, wait a minute, what's stopping these rapidly migrating planets uh, not to be sucked into their host stars? Well, the point is they stop migrating uh, when those, there's no longer sufficient gas dust 
pebbles or rocks or planetismals uh, to cause them to lose angular momentum. And so this explains why the vast majority of these big planets are orbiting close to their host stars. There's no way they can form interior to the ice line, but they form far to the exterior of the ice line and they migrate inwards. And statistically, this has happened to 83% of the known exoplanetary systems uh, where we see this very rapid, aggressive migration interior to the ice line. However, 17% don't migrate at all or they migrate outwards. And so uh, what happens is that uh, these protoplanets uh, consume the gas, dust, pebbles, rocks, and planetismals in a very short time span. Uh, then there's nothing uh, in their vicinity to cause them to lose angular momentum, so they don't migrate at all. Uh, so they just stay put. Uh, or if you wind up having several of these uh, large planets uh, forming, and typically what happens, they all form in relative close proximity to one another, because you're going to get a certain region of protoplanetary disk uh, where you've got an extra abundance of this gas dust. It's not smooth throughout the protoplanetary disk, which means that you're very likely going to get several of these big planets forming in relative proximity to one another. And when that happens, uh, you're going to uh, get, um, you're going to get scattering. In other words, one planet will gravitationally scatter one or two other planets. And uh, that has, causes these planets either to be ejected from the planetary system, uh, to be consumed by the host star, because they just get scattered so aggressively inward, they get sucked into the host star. Or what's typical, they wind up getting scattered uh, to a large distance. This explains, for example, why we're finding planets like Jupiter uh, that are orbiting 50 to 100 to 200 times more distantly from their host stars than Neptune does. What happened is uh, they got scattered and they got ejected into the far outer edges of that planetary system. Uh, and it's about 50-50 uh, between that 17%. About half of them don't migrate at all. The other half, we see that the planets have been either uh, removed from the system or they've been scattered outward. This also explains why we're finding planetary systems uh, where we don't see uh, any gas giants beyond the ice line at all, or ice giants beyond the ice line. They basically all got scattered out uh, of the system. Now, that raises an enigma. How do we explain Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune? Uh, because this actually adds up to 100% of the uh, large planets we see in exoplanetary systems. What is it about our solar system uh, that makes it unique in the sense that the uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are orbiting between uh, five and 30 times uh, the distance that Earth is from the sun? We see this nowhere else. We do see it in our solar system. And it was a team in Nice, France, uh, that discovered uh, what is so special about our solar system. And I've written briefly about this in my book, Improbable Planet. And I think the chapter I write about is a chapter we're giving away for free at reasons.org slash Ross. Uh, but what I briefly wrote about, and today I'm going to tell you a lot of stuff that's not in Improbable Planet. Uh, but what you do see in Improbable Planet is that what happened was that the uh, gas giants and ice, gi ice uh, planets in our solar system began to migrate towards the ice line. But before they got to the ice line, their migration was braked. It got stopped and reversed. And uh, the Nice team, the team of French astronomers that first came up with this, referred to this as the Grand Tac model for the solar system, uh, referring to a sail sailing term where you can actually reverse the movement of a sail ship even against the wind. And so, and they've been actually working on this for a 20 year period. And every time they come up with a paper, they come up with a more uh, detailed model uh, for what's taking place here. And uh, 
it's kind of like what's been going on for all the models that have been produced by astronomers to explain the formation of the moon. And that's something I did talk about in quite a bit of detail in Improbable Planet. How uh, the more they studied the moon forming event, the more fine tuning they discovered. They said, we can't have this degree of fine tuning that defies naturalism. But the more they studied the moon forming event, the more fine tuning they found. And it was Tim Elliott uh, who wrote an article in Nature where he said, all this fine tuning that we're discovering in the moon forming event is causing us philosophical disquiet. Same things happening when we look at the gas giants in our solar system. The fine tuning is so extraordinary and uh, so uh, ubiquitous as basically causing philosophical disquiet amongst planetary astronomers realizing uh, this does not look at all like a naturalistic event. Uh, it's evidence for the hand of the creator. And uh, what they've discovered is in order for this grand tack to work, where you get a reversal in the migration, you need the largest planet outside the ice line uh, to be closest to the ice line and have within that one planet uh, most of the mass of the planets outside the ice line. And this is the case with Jupiter. It's the closest to the ice line and Jupiter by itself has about a uh, little more than two thirds the total mass of the solar system. I mean, it's got more mass than all the rest of the solar system planets combined. Uh, and uh, next, and what also makes this model work is it's crucial uh, that the next largest by mass uh, planet be the second closest to the ice line. And it's also crucial that these two planets together make up about 90% or more of the mass of the planetary, the planets in the planetary system. This is the case with Jupiter and Saturn. We got Jupiter the biggest, the closest to the ice line that has more mass than the rest of them. And then you look at Saturn, it comes in second and it has virtually all the rest of the mass of the planets in the solar system. The other thing you need to make this work, it's important that in the protoplanetary disk uh, where these uh, large planets are forming, that Saturn be at that position relative to the ice line where the density of uh, gas, dust, rocks, pebbles, and uh, planetismals uh, be the highest. Uh, and what that does is it causes Saturn to migrate towards the ice line uh, much more rapidly then Jupiter migrates towards the ice line. And then we have Uranus and Neptune not migrating hardly at all because they're so distant uh, that there's not that much stuff that they can interact with. So they don't migrate much at all. Uh, and we have Jupiter migrating less than Saturn. And this causes Saturn to move more quickly to the ice line. And you reach a point uh, where Saturn is now making one orbit about our star, the sun, for exactly every, uh, pardon me, uh, it, it makes uh, two orbits about the sun for every three orbits. The old model was that it was a one-two resonance, uh, but we now know that doesn't uh, yield uh, the kind of small planets uh, that we see in the inner part of the solar system. Uh, so the latest models are saying it's a 3-2 resonance. A mean motion resonance is where you've got uh, two planets uh, orbiting their host star uh, where the periods, the ratio of the periods are small exact integers. And so a 1-2 resonance would be one where, for example, uh, Jupiter would be making exactly two orbits for every single orbit of Saturn. A 3-2 resonance, which is what works in this case, is you got uh, Jupiter making three orbits for every two orbits of Saturn. And what those mean motion resonances do is it means that regularly, you're gonna have the two planets lining up relative to their host star, and that causes a strong gravitational pulse to ripple through the entire planetary system. And what the Nice team in France uh, discovered is that when Saturn moves inward more rapidly and winds up having this 3-2 resonance with uh, Jupiter, 
it actually causes a reversal in the migration. It causes such a great disturbance in the gas, dust, pebbles, rocks, and planetismals that are actually results in the whole system reversing. And so we've got Saturn changing its direction away from the ice line. Same thing happens to Jupiter. To a lesser degree, uh, the same thing happens uh, to Uranus and Neptune, although they now know that Neptune was significantly impacted because at a close encounter with Jupiter and Saturn when they began the reversal of their migration. But this explains why we have this exceptional planetary system where instead of the gas giants and ice planets migrating deep interior ice line, they go towards the ice line, they stop and they reverse. Now, how close do they get to the ice line? Well, the old models were saying that Jupiter got to within uh, uh, about half uh, to about, uh, actually went interior to the ice line and then reverse. We now know it just went a little bit inside the ice line and then reverse. It got to within about two astronomical units before it turned around. So yes, I do need to correct this figure because Jupiter actually did go interior to the ice line, but only got as close to the sun as two astronomical units, quite a bit beyond the orbit of uh, Mars. And in case of Saturn, it never got to the ice line uh, before it reversed. Now, I'm going to show you in the next slide, and this is brand new uh, from the very latest research, uh, what the movements of the four big planets in our solar system look like. So you've got a time scale on the bottom. Uh, and incidentally, this is not necessarily relative uh, to the origin of the solar system but basically relative to when we begin to see uh, these migrations take place. And what you see in this particular uh, figure, uh, what you see on the left, uh, the y-axis is the distance from the sun in astronomical units, running from zero up to 30 astronomical units. And what you see in the bottom is a time scale for the migration. And there's actually two distinct models one is that this migration began early in the solar system. Another is that it began late. The very latest uh, research is favoring the early migration, namely that it took place uh, a little bit before the formation of the Earth-Moon system, uh, namely uh, no more than a few tens of millions of years uh, after the formation of the solar system, probably close to that 10 million year. Uh, but there's been a several older papers that are arguing in favor of this happening about 695 uh, million years after the formation of the solar system. So it explained the late heavy bombardment. But the very latest research is favoring an early event uh, for this uh, movement. But as you can see here, uh, Saturn indeed migrates inwardly at a much faster rate than Jupiter. You can see that Jupiter and Saturn come quite close together. Um, and, and then we see Jupiter uh, going back out. It starts off at about uh, five astronomical units, a little more than five, about six, and it winds up at about 5.2. Uh, and what's interesting is that both Jupiter and Saturn basically wind up uh, quite close to where they started. Saturn migrates out a little bit farther than uh, where it was born. Uh, but just a little bit. Uh, and then we see for Uranus, uh, it experiences just a tiny inward movement, very tiny, and then a significant outward movement uh, where it gets tossed out uh, to, uh, I think about uh, 19 astronomical units. Uh, but look what happens to Neptune. Neptune actually formed closer to our host star than Uranus did. Uh, we're looking at about 12 astronomical units. But what happened is that when Jupiter and Saturn uh, began uh, their reversal, uh, Neptune came close. And there's two models that are out there that it made a close encounter with Jupiter or a close encounter with Saturn. It really doesn't matter. Uh, with Saturn, it had to make a closer encounter than would with Jupiter. So it all depends on that. But in either way, it gets strongly ejected into the outer part of the solar system. So it gets ejected out there and it makes this long uh, journey where it winds up at about 30 astronomical units 
uh, from our star, uh, the sun. And uh, as it's moving out to 30 astronomical units, its orbit becomes highly circularized. Matter of fact, that happens with Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They begin with relatively large orbital eccentricities, but this whole grand tack has another benefit uh, for advanced life in that it causes the orbits of these big planets uh, to become approximately circular, and Neptune has uh, actually an eccentricity that's less than 1%. And the reason why uh, is that it had this uh, very aggressive ejection into the other part of the solar system. And that's actually important. The fact that Neptune has such a very tiny eccentricity uh, means that the really big asteroid and comet belts that exist beyond the orbit of Neptune are not disturbed to nearly the high degree they would be if Neptune had, say, an eccentricity of a three, four, five uh, percent. Uh, so that's another blessing for us here on planet Earth. We don't get bombarded as intensely as we otherwise would be bombarded. Now, uh, one wrinkle in this grand tack model, this was actually proposed almost 20 years ago. And one reason that wasn't fully accepted by the scientific community, it couldn't explain the Mars problem how it is that we have a planet uh, beyond Earth, a rocky planet, because the models are basically predicting that as you go away from the sun, the rocky planets will become progressively more massive. And we see that's the case uh, with Mercury, Venus, and the Earth, but Mars is the exception. Uh, it is only one ninth the mass of uh, the uh, Earth, just double the mass of uh, Mercury. And so how do we explain that tiny mass? And uh, what happened was, again, the uh, Nice group, the French astronomers, basically said, ah, if we put a fifth uh, big planet into the primordial solar system, we can explain the tiny mass of uh, Mars. And it's a planet that would come in at about 10 times the mass of Earth. So it'd be a little bit smaller than Uranus and Neptune. Neptune is 17 times the mass of Earth and Uranus a little less than uh, 14. Uh, this would be 10 times the mass of the Earth. And uh, it, in, in this whole grand tack, not only Neptune, but also this third ice planet makes a close contact uh, with Jupiter and Saturn, more likely with Jupiter, and gets kicked out of the solar system entirely or it gets kicked out to a distance that's 50 to 100 times uh, more distant from the sun than Neptune is. Matter of fact, uh, astronomers have been noticing when they've been looking at the uh, uh, Kuiper belt, asteroids and comets, and the scattered belt, these are comets and asteroids that exist uh, anywhere from uh, uh, you know, 40 uh, out to 100 astronomical units and they're noticing that there's this tight knot of orbits. <laughs> That's indicative of what you'd expect uh, if there was this fifth uh, big planet. And so uh, there's a search going on right now to see if they can find that. On the other hand, I've seen papers published saying, if we get a star uh, coming relatively close to our planetary system, it could explain the same uh, groupings together of these orbits uh, of these objects. And so there's two models, but bottom line is both of the models, whether that uh, extra ice planet gets completely ejected from the solar system or gets ejected out to 50 to 100 times uh, further away from, farther away from the sun than Neptune is, in either case, it can explain the small mass of Mars. And a small mass of Mars, I mentioned earlier, is crucial to explain advanced life here on planet Earth. Okay, what I'm going to do next Sunday is to explain to you uh, all the different benefits we get from this grand tack. It not only explains uh, uh, Mars, it explains how we get the formation of uh, Venus and of the Earth, it explains how Earth gets its supply of water and its gases because the moon forming event basically eradicates all the water and atmosphere of the Earth. This explains how it gets that return. 
and it also explains the asteroid and comet belts. Because that's the other thing I want to talk to you about is that our planetary system has a system of asteroids and comets that we don't see in any other planetary system. What we see in other planetary systems are asteroid and comet belts that are a thousand times or more bigger than the ones in our planetary system, or they don't have any at all. We have exactly the kind of comet and asteroid belts that we need for advanced life. And I'll briefly talk about why we have to have asteroids and comets, all the crucial benefits we get from them. Yes, we get bombarded once in a while, but those bombardments are essential to have our planet capable of sustaining advanced life. Okay, I've gone about uh, two and a half minutes over, so I'm gonna stop here. And I'm hoping that next week we'll actually be able to finish this series and jump into our next series. So uh, let me uh, exit and uh, stop share. And uh, we should be back into the Q&A mode. You, uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. I'm gonna open with a question that I have myself. Uh, going back to that chart that you just showed us on the Grand Tack, it looks like the orbit of Neptune and Uranus would have crossed at some point. So for some period of time, they would have maintained the same orbit. What kept them from just running into each other? Well, I mean, they may, the, the orbital paths definitely cross. On the other hand, they may not have been close to one another at all. I mean, if you've got Uranus on the opposite side of the orbit that Neptune is on, uh, they would have uh, no gravitational interaction with one another. And uh, notice too, how rapidly uh, you get Neptune moving from uh, 12 astronomical units uh, out to about 25. And so it's not gonna be in that common orbit uh, with Neptune long enough for there to be any significant gravitational disturbance. But thank you for asking that question. I've been asked that question before. We have a question from Juven, and Juven always gets a hold of us from the Netherlands. He says, I have heard of in of your talks that the more <coughs> the sinful acts that we engage in are, there are more bad effects that we have. And he thinks, is, he's asking if it has something to do with the law of thermal dynamics. Could you please elaborate on that? Well, he's right. And it's the main theme of my book, uh, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And again, free chapter at reasons.org slash Ross. However, it, it's a general principle that the more sin and evil we humans commit, because of the second law of thermodynamics and because of the law of gravity and electromagnetism, uh, we're going to be stuck uh, with more work, uh, more pain, and more wasted time to undo the damage that accumulates from the expression of our sin and evil. But this also explains why the Bible is so filled uh, with commands to people in authority, whether it be the police, the army, uh, or parents or teachers, uh, or the government or the justice system. <coughs> Those authority structures are in place to ensure that the individual humans who are committing the sin and the evil are the ones that are experiencing the extra pain, the extra work, and the wasted time. I mean, any of us who are parents realize how skilled our children become at transferring the consequences of their expressions of sin and evil uh, to their parents. And so I've had to discipline myself, for example, when my sons were young, that uh, when they did something that turned their room into utter chaos, that it'd be faster for me to go in there and uh, restore it all. Uh, but for the benefit of my sons, I need to make them restore the room uh, to its proper condition, have them experience the extra work, the wasted time, and uh, the extra pain. But you actually see that in Genesis 3. Uh, when God confronts Adam and Eve after they sin against him, he says, from now on, you'll experience extra pain and extra work. He doesn't mention the wasted time, but hey, if you're going through extra pain and extra work, there will be uh, extra time spent. And I'm a firm believer that those texts, I mean, we do have 
God speaking to Eve and saying, from now on, you're going to have extra pain in childbirth. And he speaks to Adam and says, from now on, you're going to be experiencing extra work. But I think those texts, based on what we see elsewhere in the Bible, are not necessarily targeting one sex against the other. I mean, because of the expression of sin and evil, women, just as equally as men, uh, go through uh, extra work. And likewise, this is something my wife shared with me, that the greatest pain in childbirth is not what happens when you're in the delivery room. The greatest pain in childbirth is what happens to your children as they begin to grow up and they begin to express a sin and evil. And as a parent, you got to watch that. And all of us as parents have said, you know, it'd be great if we could prevent our children from going down these pathways. But hey, we're all sinners, it all happens. But indeed, that's the greatest pain of being a parent, as you're seeing your children unnecessarily experiencing the consequences of sin and evil. But yeah, you'll see a whole lot more and why the universe is the way it is. And here's the good news. Once evil is eradicated by our creator, we get to go to a new creation where there is no thermodynamics, there is no gravity, there is no electromagnetism, there will be no, uh, and you know, all this death, pain, work, wasted time, uh, that's gonna be in the past. So we got a great future to look forward to. Very good. Um, the next question is from Tonette, and I want to remind everybody, if you could, let us know where you're from. We'd really like to know. And she asks really an excellent question. She says, thank you for the work you have done over your lifetime of Christian service. You have made an enormous difference in my life by answering my questions about what seemed like paradoxes in the Bible that made the logic of God and the fairness of God. I have lots of views, opinions, and questions that I have formed from my reading of the Bible and have interpreted them through my experience and what I believe God's character to be. I feel that I feel that it is important to submit these ideas to others to get the best argument against them so that I do not delude myself and go off in the wrong direction. That includes difficult subjects like racial reconciliation among Christians or Christianity and politics. However, most of the Christians I know do not like to argue about theology lived out in the real world, and they feel that I am being irreverent when I pose a question like that. So my question is this, how important is it to have a circle of Christian friends that a person can submit their theology to for critique? It's very important. I mean, just a few days ago, I was doing an event uh, with astrophysics professors at the University of Durham in the United Kingdom. And that was their comment, uh, that the problem with uh, many churches in Britain, there's no opportunity for this kind of theological uh, discussion, dialogue, and debate. And what I really enjoyed about this uh, group, most of them were atheists, uh, but they were eager to engage in this kind of dialogue, and they did it in a very friendly spirit. And so I think there's impression in a lot of churches that, hey, if we invite these unbelievers to come in and challenge our views, uh, they're going to behave in a very nasty way. Well, some do. Uh, but Ross, I think you and I have both experienced the Richard Dawkins out there uh, and the Peter Atkins are the exceptions. Uh, most people who are educated and call themselves agnostics or atheists really just want to have a venue where they can engage in a friendly dialogue or debate on these issues. And that's been the reason why I founded the Paradoxes class 45 years ago, is to provide that venue where we can encourage open dialogue and debate. That's one reason why we structure the class where most of the time is devoted to uh, questions and uh, where we can talk about a whole variety of topics. Because uh, frankly, I think people are starved for that. and. I think that's one of the failings of the church is that we're not providing the means for that. I mean, many churches here in America, at least, are structured in such a way uh, that there's a lot of uh, praise singing. Uh, there's a short sermon and everybody leaves. There's no opportunity to really uh, challenge the message of the sermon, to dialogue about, to try to dig deeper, to do research. And a lot of the Sunday classes 
that are supposed to be where we dig into these things. Again, often it's structured as a one-way communication. It needs to be a two-way communication. You see that with Paul in the book of Acts. You know, he would actually spend an entire evening into the wee hours uh, just dialoguing with people uh, about these issues. You see that when he went into the Areopagus in Athens, uh, he engaged the philosophers that were there. Uh, we need to be doing this. This is what church is all about. And uh, you say, and I think part of it is too, we look at the other religions that don't practice a free market exchange of ideas. Uh, I mean, I was doing an event in uh, India through this uh, Zoom medium. And uh, you'll love the name of this church. It's a nickname for the church, the Church of the Inscrutable Algorithm, because it's a church that's uh, almost entirely populated by scientists and engineers. In fact, I had the chairman of the Department of uh, Engineering and uh, Science uh, from the local university. They were all in attendance. But the reason why these people are coming is that they really encourage this kind of uh, open dialogue and debate. And again, it's a place where we can really practice giving good reasons for our faith with gentleness, respect, uh, and a clear conscience. But one of the things those scientists in that Church of the Inscrutable Algorithm mentioned was apparently in India, each state in India gets to decide what the religious laws will be like. And there are two Christian states. Uh, they're not very populous, but there are two Christian states, and those are the only two states uh, that practice freedom of religion, where they basically say, we're going to have an open market, free market exchange of religious and theological ideas. We're not going to try to constrain uh, people's thinking. And I would just say that for Christianity in general, we need to really practice that free market exchange of ideas. If you got the truth, uh, then challenges uh, won't be a problem. I think a careful reading of scripture is pretty clear that that Bible encourages that. It does, yeah. Uh, I put it this way, the Bible discourages cynicism but encourages skepticism. We're to test everything. But a cynic is someone who finds out what the truth is and says, forget it. A skeptic is someone who says, I want to know what the truth is. I want to put it to the test. But when they find it, they embrace it. That's the difference between a cynic and a skeptic. But you're right. The Bible loves uh, Christianity, God. They love skeptics. I would say to Tonette, find, uh, start by looking in the Bible itself and look for the passages that talk about questioning things and looking into things and share those passages with your friends to get them to understand that this is how we're supposed to learn and how we're supposed to tune each other up if we're going down the wrong path, because we all do sometimes. We all do, and uh, I think what I'm seeing here, at least in America, is especially young people uh, getting together at a coffee shop and spending a couple of hours talking about theology. And the reason they do that, there's no opportunity to do it in the church. Uh, so they'll go to a coffee shop and do it. And uh, to me, that's a sad comment on the status of the church, is that we're seeing uh, millennials in particular having to go to a Starbucks rather than go to a church to engage in serious theological dialogue. Yes. You, our next question is from Stephen Posta again in Spring, Texas. He says, oh my goodness, I lost the question. I'm sorry. Um, there it is. There is a, an exoplanet hot Jupiter named WASP 76b, and it is tidally locked so close to its host star that it rains iron. Scientists suspect both Jupiter and Saturn may have diamond rain. Titan experiences methane rain. Is Earth the odd planet because it has water rain? Well, uh, it is in the sense that, uh, you know, we're a small enough planet and uh, at a particular distance from the star uh, where you're not going to have methane rain. Uh, methane is gas gaseous, whereas in Titan it's liquid. And so uh, you do get uh, methane rain on a Titan just because how extremely cold it is uh, out there. And likewise, you've got a very strong gravitational pull, either from a host star of a planet's orbiting close to it, 
or if you've got a planet, say, several times the mass of Jupiter, and you've got a moon orbiting it close enough, that gravity can be so strong that it begins to break apart the planet or the moon. And this is where you can get iron, titanium, and other elements being pulled uh, out of that particular body. But you've got to be very close uh, for that to happen. It's called the Roche limit. Uh, when you get sufficiently close to a massive body, this is when the body begins to be torn apart uh, by the tidal forces. Next question is from our friend Doug again in Monrovia. I think I didn't quite finish asking all of his question previous. He says, where did energy come from? How did it originate? Was it from dark energy? Do scientists have any idea as to how 13.8 billion years ago energy came on the scene and originated in a naturalistic sense? It got speculations, but yeah, I mean, it tells us in several places in the Bible that uh, before God created anything, he was actually initiating his works of redemption. So God was active before anything was created uh, by him. And that the creation of the universe is actually the first moment that the space-time dimensions of the universe exist. So when God created the universe 13.8 billion years ago, that's when uh, matter and energy, space and time all came into existence. If you want to go into it a little more detail, actually the story is that the space-time dimensions uh, come into existence uh, really clear. Uh, really early, uh, and later we get the appearance of photons. That happens when the universe is about a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. That's when the space-time curvature is released and uh, makes photons, and then shortly thereafter uh, we get matter showing up for the first time. But by the time the universe is a billionth of a second old, we got all the matter, energy, and space and time that the universe has from that point forward. So there is a beginning and the space-time theorems actually established that such a beginning took place. Now this is something you'll find in the fourth edition of the Crater in the Cosmos. I actually go into how atheist physicists and astronomers respond to this very compelling evidence that there must be this being beyond space-time that creates our universe. And they speculate along the lines, well maybe uh, there's a universe that predates ours that instead of expanding is contracting. And so it contracts all the way down and somehow reverses and expands. Uh, but it was the British physicist Roger Penrose that said, well, that's an interesting speculation, uh, but you got the problem of trying to join the geometry of a collapsing universe to the geometry of an expanding universe. There's also speculations where they say, maybe time is going backwards and reverse and now it goes forwards. Well, once again, you got a geometry problem. And the geometry problem is roughly akin to speculation about wormholes. Uh, I think we've all been exposed to wormholes through science fiction movies. Uh, Babylon 5 uh, was one such, or, and then there's another TV show that basically was talking about these uh, wormholes. A wormhole is where you got two black holes and every black hole has a singularity, a space-time uh, position where everything is being sucked into. And so what mathematicians have speculated is that maybe you could have the singularity of black hole A uh, perfectly join the singularity of black hole B. And if that were to happen, it'd be possible for someone to travel from the space-time realm here through the wormhole and come out to a different space-time realm. So yeah, it's great for science fiction. Mathematically, uh, it's conceivable, but physically, it's impossible. Uh, Kip Thorne was the one who, more than a decade ago, made the point. Yeah, mathematically, it works. Physically, it doesn't. The reason it doesn't work physically is the probability of getting the singularity of black hole A to perfectly touch the singularity of black hole B is zero. Moreover, even if that were to happen, you get a stability problem. The probability that they would remain at, at perfectly joined to one another uh, for more than a tiny fraction of a second 
likewise is zero. And moreover, you don't want to get anywhere close to a black hole anyway. As you begin to approach a black hole, the gravity will cause your six foot tall body to be stretched out over four miles. You literally become a string of fundamental particles. And as you get closer in the black hole, uh, all of that uh, gets sucked in uh, towards the interior. Not at all a pleasant experience. So yeah, the movie Interstellar, it's not gonna work that way. Uh, you'll be utterly destroyed. And same thing with trying to join one of these speculated uh, universes where space and time will operate differently. It's not going to work. Another question, Hugh, from Stephen in uh, Texas. He says, over the years, you have played a critical role in my understanding of the origins of the universe, but I'd like to get a better understanding of the end of this age. What writer or speaker would you say best represents your eschatological views that I could research? Well, I put a number of articles. You'll find them at reasons.org where I talk about what would happen if God were not to intervene in the future physics of the universe. And uh, you know, one is called the heat death of the universe uh, because we now know that the universe is expanding more and more rapidly as time goes on, which is gonna cause objects to move apart from one another. And eventually that would cause the sun to be moving away from the earth at greater than the velocity of light. And, uh, and also it causes everything uh, to reach the same temperature. And when that happens, there's no possibility for movement, work or life. Now we're talking a couple of hundred billion years in the future, but that would happen. But as this expansion of the universe continues, it actually affects the fundamental particles. And so what happens is that you can no longer have protons, electrons, and neutrons. And eventually space and time itself, the fabric of space and time gets ripped. And so if you put into the search engine at reasons.org, the big rip, that article will pop up. Uh, so yes, uh, no matter how you look at it, the universe cannot be eternal. And that's significant because a lot of atheists are counting on an eternal future existence for the universe. But the physics of our universe proves that that is not possible, it can't happen. However, the Bible tells us that the moment that God eradicates evil, that's when he will speak the universe out of existence and replace that universe with a new creation, the new creation that is described in Revelation uh, 21 and 22. And that's a realm where there'll be no thermodynamics, gravity, or electromagnetism. Strong and weak nuclear forces won't operate there. And uh, none of that's necessary because there's no possibility for evil uh, to ever exist there. This incidentally is unique to Christianity. Christianity alone amongst the world's religions teaches two entirely independent creations. Yes, other religions speak about a heaven, but the heaven they talk about is something that can be uh, squeezed in uh, to the physics and the dimensions of this universe. The Christianity teaches it'll be a completely different realm. And how that's gonna happen, it tells us in two places in the book of Isaiah and in Second Peter, that in the future, God's gonna wrap up the universe like a scroll and turn it into a fiery heat. Uh, basically, how I would interpret that as a physicist, it implies that God's going to take the space-time dimensionality of the universe that's been stretching outward for 13.8 billion years and suddenly collapse it all into a singularity. And when you collapse it into a singularity, the heat goes up to near infinity. So that'd be one way of interpreting those texts literally. However, I do have friends uh, who are fluent in Hebrew who look at those texts and say, I think they can be interpreted as figures of speech. But I find it interesting as an astrophysicist, you can actually make it work if you interpret it literally. In this sense, we now have made measurements in the universe. In fact, a paper came out just a few days ago. I'm gonna be writing about it in my August 10th blog, how we now have additional evidence that the geometry of the universe is flat not two-dimensional flat, but 10-dimensional flat. And we know we can only see that flatness out to a certain limit because of uh, our telescopes can only go so far and because of the fact that it's limited by the age of the universe. 
we know the universe is bigger, in fact, than the universe that we can see. So beyond what we can see, there's a possibility that this flat sheet, let me give you an example of this. That we can all see here. Okay, this is a two dimensional sheet. Which you can see here, a two dimensional sheet. And we can think of the universe as being say, just a small portion along the sheet. But if we go far along that sheet, we could actually have it fold in on itself like this, uh, where that 10 dimensional sheet in another dimension becomes U-shaped. And if we have the two pieces, the two sides of this 10 dimensional sheet come close enough together, uh, you could actually have a quantum space-time fluctuation on the top part of the 10 dimensional sheet make contact with a space-time fluctuation on the bottom part. And if that were to happen, the entire universe, as large as it is, would all get sucked up into a singularity in the whole universe that would disappear in a fiery heat like we see described in Second Peter chapter 3. Now, how close do those uh, two parts of that 10-dimensional flat sheet have to be towards one another for that to be a possibility in a time scale less than 20 billion years? They need to be about a millimeter apart. So it's kind of mind-boggling to think that part of this vast universe could be a millimeter away from us in a dimension that we can't see or touch. You, uh, one of the things that Stephen is looking for is not just the astrophysical end of the universe, but the, the end of the age of humans that Jesus was talking about. So right. you, had, you, know, you went through that long revelation study and other studies that talk about your eschatological views about how, right. how humanity will end up as humanity. Right. Uh, are there other speakers or writers that best represent your eschatological views that he could research? Right. Well, uh, about 40 years ago, I launched a seven-year class in Paradoxes uh, where we looked at the book of Revelation uh, but I taught it in the context that this is a capstone to the Old Testament prophetic books. So we wound up spending uh, seven years and nine months going through a little more than one third of all the texts in the Bible, because there's a whole lot in the Old Testament that's relevant to what we see in the book of Revelation. And uh, participants referred to that as a seven-year tribulation. A little inside joke there. Okay. Um, and yes, there are a lot of Bible authors, uh, Bible scholars that agree with me that we're going to see the transfer of redeemed humans from this creation to the new creation in the relatively near future. I mean, my eschatology, and eschatology is just a fancy word uh, for your beliefs about how uh, human civilization is going to end and what's going to happen thereafter. And uh, basically, my position is that Jesus made a promise that the moment we followers of Jesus Christ take the good news of salvation to all the people groups of the world, where we see a significant fraction of people in each of those people groups become serious followers of Jesus Christ, then he's going to come back. There will be a second coming. Just like Elijah comes at two different times, the Messiah comes at two different times. And when he comes back, he's going to fulfill the other two-thirds of Old Testament prophecy that pertain to the Messiah. I mean, the biggest reason why a number of Jews don't accept Jesus as Messiah is he didn't fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies. Well, he fulfilled over 100. That's quite impressive. And as the book of Daniel makes clear in chapter 9, the Messiah fulfills these Old Testament prophecies at two distinct comings. The second coming will occur the moment uh, we Christians fulfill that command at the end of the book of Matthew and the beginning of uh, the book of Acts. When that happens, he's coming back. And something I wrote about it in an improbable planet is that already evangelical Christians have the people, the financial resources, and the technology to finish that task in less than 10 years. All we lack is a motivation. We have all the resources we need to do it. And you think with the promise of the new creation, 
that should give us plenty of motivation to go ahead and make that happen. Now, I wrote the book, uh, Weathering Climate Change, basically making the point uh, that we can extend extreme climate stability uh, for at least another thousand years, maybe as much as 1400 to 1500 years. But once we enter uh, the next ice age, that's gonna bring about such extreme climate instability that it's not gonna be possible to sustain human civilization for a large human population. Therefore, uh, my position is we're gonna be exiting this universe. Uh, it will be replaced by the new creation and something less than 14 to 1500 years. And uh, if you're pre-millennial in your theology, we got Jesus at the start of the second coming reigning from 1,000 years on planet Earth. So in that case, we're gonna need at least another uh, 1,000 years. Uh, but not all of my colleagues at Reasons to Believe are pre-millennialists. I'm a pre-millennialist, uh, but Ken Samples, for example, is an amillennialist. And in his theology, uh, we could have our entry in the new creation happening in less than 1,000 years. But we're not talking millions of years or even tens of thousands of years. And something I wrote about in Weathering Climate Change, there's a chapter there on what natural events will bring about the end of humanity. And uh, certainly we're talking about the end of humanity as occurring in less than a few million years from now. Because a few million years from now, the sun will be too bright to make possible photosynthesis on the surface of the earth. Uh, but just the onset of the next ice age rules out global human civilization. And my understanding of the book of Revelation and Daniel, that continues until the second coming. Hugh, can you recommend some specific authors who might share your uh, end of times views? Well, uh, I think you'll find books called uh, Four Views on the Millennium, which basically gives you the spectrum from people with different views. It includes two pre-millennial views, an amillennial view, and a post-millennial view. So it gives you a good spectrum of what are considered to be acceptable eschatological positions to take within the Christian community. I don't know of any other author uh, who takes on the same interpretation that I presented in that seven year, nine month class. Incidentally, we're trying to recover the recordings that all that got recorded, that it got edited where we took out all the repetition, took out all the announcements. Uh, so it's just the, the core uh, content. And uh, we're gonna try to get that back up on the paradoxes.org website. Thank you. What would you label your view to be? Well, uh, I'm pre-millennial. I also do believe there will be a seven year tribulation period, uh, but I'm not a pre-tribulationist uh, eschatologist. I believe that uh, Christians will remain here to a little bit less than halfway through that seven year tribulation period. So I refer to myself as believing in a pre-mid uh, uh, rapture point of view, because that's another point of controversy. Is there gonna be a rapture of the church where God comes and takes away all Bible believing Christians from planet earth uh, for a short period of time, or is that not gonna happen at all? I argued in the course uh, based on certain texts that there will indeed be such an event, but also made the point, there's a variety of different views on the timing of that event. And I think where a lot of people have erred is thinking that we can come up uh, with a precise year uh, or a precise week or a month. And what we see in the Bible is whatever we talk about future prophetic fulfillment, no man knows the hour or the day. Uh, about the best you're going to come up with is a week. Noah, for example, was in the ark uh, for a week before the rain came down. So he wasn't told the exact day. Uh, no prophet is. And so I argue that the events that take place at the midpoint of that seven-year period, we need to understand that those dates have an accuracy no better than plus or minus 10 days. And so I think people have read too much into the numbers you see in the English translations, especially in the book of Daniel, we need to realize uh, we're only given those numbers to three places of the decimal. 
So it's plus or minus uh, 10 days. So my view is we're gonna have the rapture occurring somewhere between one to three weeks of the midpoint of the tribulation period. My, my point of view on Revelation is that the point of the whole book is, is this, prepare to be amazed and blown away. Right. Not figure out what the order of events is going to be or when it is going to happen. Well, we need to realize that the book of Revelation, like all the Old Testament books that talk about uh, events in the future, have multiple purposes. One of the things we did when we went through that uh, book of Revelation course was actually look at how the book of Revelation gives us explicit teaching on the doctrine of the Trinity, actually tells us how we should be managing our churches. I mean, those letters to the church, we spent a long time there just going through all that on what that means about church history. Uh, There's prophecy there about church history, but also great insights on how we can better uh, manage uh, our church and our church ministries. That's just two examples. And that's typical of virtually every biblical book. Uh, it's written with several distinct purposes in mind. Thank you, Hugh. Our next question is from Ryan. He says, I watched a part of a Joe Rogan interview with George Knapp, who is a UFO reporter. And apparently the UFO community thinks a massive New York Times article about a government UFO crash retrieval program is coming soon. I know you have done a UFO book. Do you have any knowledge or opinion about UFO crash or debris retrieval stuff? Sounds like something out of a movie. Right. Well, we did address that in our book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, saying that, uh, yes, uh, something did happen there at Roswell, uh, but the government is telling us that the debris they found uh, was from a military endeavor. It's got nothing to do with this uh, UFO thing. And what we talked about in the book is how there's nearly 2,000 documented cases of a UFO crashing into the earth. And these are cases where multiple observers have been able to track the trajectory of the UFO through the atmosphere. And what you notice is no sonic boom and no heat friction as it goes through the atmosphere. I cite those as two evidences we're looking at phenomena that's not physical in nature. And yet when you go to the crash site, you see evidence that there's a shallow crater. Often the ground is depressed by as much as one foot. If there's snow, the snow is melted. If there's vegetation, the vegetation shows evidence of damage. But as you look all around that crater site, you find no debris and no artifacts. If it was a physical object that crashed into the earth, you would find debris, you would find some physical artifacts. In all these documented cases, the amount of debris and artifacts is zero. Now, I had the privilege of taking a short course from Carl Sagan uh, when I was in graduate school at the University of Toronto. One of the things he's taught about in that course is, he says this UFO thing, there's nothing to it at all. Uh, it's scientifically impossible. Uh, so don't believe it. Uh, however, his worldview did not tolerate the existence of non-physical reality. He believed that that was impossible. Everything has to be physical if it's real. But the Bible tells us that angels and demons are real beings, uh, but they don't necessarily have a physical uh, impact or entity. Uh, there are instances in the Bible where we see them engaging in physical ways, but apparently that's not compelled upon them. They don't have to do that. And so the conclusion we drew in Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men is that these non-physical phenomena really do happen. They're real. We can't deny it. The evidence is overwhelming uh, that these kinds of phenomena really do occur uh, where there's no physical debris or artifacts, uh, but there are physical effects. And, and they violate the laws of physics. And... Um, what we also, as you dig deeper into that, what you discover is the only humans that have those experiences with that category of UFOs. I say category because 99% of the UFO reports I've processed in my career have 
an explanation, either a natural explanation or some kind of human explanation. 1% do not. I'm talking about that 1% residual. And the only people that have those kinds of experiences are people with open doors to the occult. Explains, for example, why you might have multiple observers seeing the same UFO phenomena. All of them have open doors to the occult. And what I do in that book, Licensed Sky and Little Green Man, is say, this is scientifically testable. If you get rid of all those open doors, that'll be the end of your UFO experiences. If you open all those doors, that's going to increase the probability you'll have those experiences. And some of the statistical evidence is, notice that in certain countries, a larger percentage of the population are having these encounters. That's even true here in the U.S. Alaska and Hawaii are two states where you have a higher incidence than you do, say, in Idaho uh, or you have in Massachusetts. But those are states where you've got a larger percentage of the population involved in the occult. Equatorial Brazil, very high. Uh, when I went to the Soviet Union to speak to scientists there, when the communists were still running the show, very high incidence of people having encounters with UFOs. Uh, now, with perestroika and the, the Communist Party uh, is gone, uh, we see far fewer Russians uh, having these experiences. But during the Soviet era, the Soviet government was encouraging research in occult physics. So that's why I was encountering so many physicists uh, when I was making those trips uh, that uh, were having these UFO encounters. And incidentally, part of the research tells us this is not benign. This is not the activity of the righteous angels. It's the activity of the evil angels. Because 100% of humans who've had close encounters, you have horrible deleterious effects. The best you're going to come away from if you have one of those close encounters is recurring terrifying nightmares. Say, so what's the worst case? Worst case, you get killed by the incidents. Many people have been injured. Uh, in those, especially the very close encounters. But you can read more in Lights in the Sky on Little Green Men. Thank you, Hugh. Our next question is from Juven, again in the Netherlands. He says, could we expect to see the uniqueness of our solar system existing in other exoplanetary systems after millions of years? Yeah, I don't think waiting extra time is going to help. I mean, there are uh, two satellites or two spacecraft that are uh, going to soon be discovering more of these exoplanets, as uh, Kepler has basically finished its mission. Uh, but yeah, there's going to be, so we're going to be discovering a lot more of these exoplanets. Uh, but, you know, when we began to discover them back in 1995, astronomers were convinced that uh, we're going to be able to find a whole lot of planets just like we see in our solar system. But as I've been sharing with these past two weeks, that's not borne out. We've not even been able to find a twin of Mercury or a twin of Jupiter, let alone a twin of the Earth. And I'm predicting that as we continue to make these kinds of discoveries, we may indeed uh, find planets that have similar characteristics to one of the planets in our solar system. What I believe is going to continue to stand out we will not find an exoplanetary system that's sufficiently like our planetary system that it could be a candidate for advanced life. Because as we've been pointing out here, we not only need Earth to be fine-tuned, every one of the eight planets must be fine-tuned. The moon has to be fine-tuned. The asteroid and comet belts have to be fine-tuned. So simply discovering, say, a twin of Saturn is not going to be adequate. You need to find a system that matches all of these fine-tuned features of our solar system. And I got some quotes I'm going to share with you next week that are already in the scientific literature, basically making the point, no matter how much research we're doing, uh, we're not going to come up with it because the fine-tuning is so extremely ubiquitous and extraordinary. There is no possibility from a naturalistic perspective. Having said that, an important caveat that still leaves the door open that God may have chosen 
to create another system just like ours somewhere else. We don't see any evidence of that. I'm just simply agreeing with these astronomers. From a naturalistic perspective, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. But if God were to choose to supernaturally intervene in the same fashion he intervened in our planetary system, it could happen. So if we do find a twin of our planetary system, it's going to be because God created it in the same fashion he created ours. But all the astronomical evidence tells us this seems to be the only place that God has intervened to that degree. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Brian asks us, young earth and old earth creationism can't both be right. Will God hold us to account for which way we believe? Well, he's right. They can't both be right. Uh, an analogy I've used is a woman can't be pregnant and not pregnant at the same time. It's either one or the other. And uh, likewise, the universe can't be old and young at the same time. Some people have argued that maybe the universe could be old and the earth could be young. The problem is this actually comes from Henry Morris himself, the past president of the Institute for Creation Research. He wrote a book basically making the point <coughs> that it's not possible to separate the physics of the earth from the physics of the universe to such a degree where you could have the universe billions of years old and the earth only uh, thousands of years old. Is God going to hold us accountable for we believe on this? Well, I think he's going to hold us accountable to be students of his book of nature and his book of scripture. So yes, he wants us to become educated about these things. Uh, but is it going to be a factor for whether or not we enter into the new creation? In my perspective, not at all. This is not a doctrine that has any significant bearing uh, on any of the doctrines that pertain to salvation. And the evidence I give for that is look at the creeds of the church. These creeds, and incidentally, you'll actually find creeds in the uh, New Testament. Uh, you know, Paul uh, gives some creedal statements and Peter does as well. So the creeds are actually in scripture, but you'll find longer creeds outside of scripture. But what the church has done is to codify in those creeds the doctrines that are essential to the Christian faith, and they purposely leave out the doctrines that are not essential to the Christian faith. So they allow, for example, for a fair amount of freedom and how we interpret end times uh, prophecy. Uh, likewise, none of the creeds address the age of the earth or the age of the universe. It's not an important doctrine uh, for salvation. And so, yeah, there's no reason why young earth creationists and old earth creationists shouldn't be enjoying fellowship with one another. This is not a salvation issue. Some of my young earth friends agree with me on that. Some of them do not. Thank you, Hugh. Our next question is from our friend Mark Durham here in the Los Angeles area. He's an ecologist. He says, assuming a large fifth inner planet was ejected from the solar system, where then did the small Mars come from? Could it be a left behind moon of the ejected planet? Now what that ejection does is the combination of the grand tack of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, where we have uh, this fifth big planet ejected or tossed out very far into the outer reaches of the solar system, that actually affects uh, the formation of the rocky planets uh, that are interior to the ice line. And uh, you know, it's not that uh, Mars is the moon that escaped away from Jupiter. It's actually uh, you know, an, an embryo rocky planet that's forming when these events took take place. That's one reason why we see research today favoring an earlier date for the Grand Tack. It better explains uh, the small mass of Mars. Uh, and some other things I'll be talking about uh, next week is that this grand tag movement and this ejection explains what happened to the main belt of asteroids. Uh, that main belt was actually much larger uh, before this grand tag took place. And actually there was bodies that extended all the way to the orbit of Mars. What the grand tag did is it eradicated uh, about two thirds of the asteroids and comets uh, in the main belt and it eradicated those that were closest to Mars. 
And so the elimination of what they call the E-belt, the E-belt is the inner part of the main belt of asteroids. The eradication of that E-belt by this gravitational dynamics with Jupiter, Saturn, <coughs> and this uh, third ice uh, planet, uh, that prevented Mars from getting as big as it otherwise would be. And also as a benefit that uh, it really shrunk down the size of that main belt. And uh, not only that, it kept the main belt asteroids relatively far away from us. So we don't get bombarded uh, so many times that it would make advanced civilization impossible. So for two reasons, we need that to happen. You don't want Mars to be too big because that will affect our orbit. Uh, also, we don't want that main belt of asteroids to be too big or to have too many of the asteroids close to Earth. Hugh, this is my follow-up question to that. Are there any major features of the solar system that the Grand Tack hypothesis does not explain well? Well, one, the last one was uh, they were concerned about how well it explains the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is the most distant of the asteroid and comet belts. Uh, it goes all the way out to a couple of trillion miles away from the sun. Uh, but a paper just got published literally last week. And if you go to my Twitter page, uh, you'll find a link to that paper, basically where I make the point that they've now come up with a new wrinkle on the Grand Tech model that explains the features of the Earth cloud of asteroids and comets. Now, important caveat, it explains some of those features. Basically explains the features of the larger Earth cloud bodies. The paper ended by saying, we don't have the telescope power to really see what's happening with the smaller Earth cloud objects, but we now can explain what's going on with the bigger objects. And so the next challenge is, okay, can this model actually explain uh, the vast majority of the comets and the asteroids in the Earth cloud we can't see yet? Well, we're gonna need the extremely large telescopes that are being constructed to be able to put it to that test. So bottom line is, this grand tack explains everything we know about the solar system that's easy to measure. Uh, there's a lot more measurements we could make that we can't make right now, and that would enable us. But the to me, the success of the Grand Tech model is every time we make a new discovery about the solar system, uh, we put that to the test and the Grand Tech can be adjusted to explain it. But the important caveat, it does usually mean a tiny adjustment to the Grand Tech model. So our Grand Tech model is getting better and better. It's similar to the Big Bang creation model. We keep refining the model to explain more and more about the universe as we learn more and more about the universe. Same thing with the Grand Tech. Thank you, Hugh. Hugh, we have two minutes left, so this will be the last question. It's from Chris Thompson in Anchorage, Alaska. Could you please share your thoughts regarding a proper Christian response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Many churches are fighting mandates to control it. Some are stating it's a religious liberty issue and unconstitutional. It seems that it is creating bad optics for the spread of Christianity in this country. Please comment. Yeah, I mean, he's making an excellent comment. I mean, I'm still working at home because uh, I'm in a high risk category. So I'm not eager to engage people uh, close. And uh, I mean, I do think uh, that keeping the bars closed is a good idea because what happens in bars, people are sitting close together. Uh, there's a lot of noise. Uh, so they're talking loudly and they're spitting on one another. And it's a great way to spread the virus. So yeah, I mean, uh, it might be a sacrifice that you can't have a drink with one of your friends. Uh, but if you're concerned about the health of your friends, I think you're gonna go along with this. I think where America is different from China is we're basically having medical experts telling us what we should do in response to this virus. Uh, but not forcing them. So we're being told, you know, we all need to wear masks when we're in public. That's just good health advice. And I, I've made five ministry trips to Japan before this pandemic. And, uh, you know, a lot of Japanese just wear masks all the time when they're in public because they don't want to get the common cold. 
well, this is a, a disease that's much worse than the common cold or worse than the flu. So yes, your government is telling you, you need to wear a mask. I would say that's good medical advice. You need to do it. Yes, it's an infringement on your freedom, but you need to think about the freedom of others. Do you really want your friends, your relatives, your associates uh, getting this virus? So for their sake, it's, I think it's good to go along with this. And, uh, you know, we need to be sure that uh, we're um, actually not stressing uh, our medical system, the hospitals. So I think trying to flatten the curve is a good idea because you don't want to overwhelm uh, the intensive care units at the hospitals. And frankly, that's what's happening in many of the southern states in the U.S. Uh, they're, they're at risk of overwhelming uh, their medical care system. And I think a lot of that is the fact that uh, we had a number of public riots going on a few weeks ago. And uh, given the uh, delay in which this virus begins to show uh, significant symptoms, I think the, what we're experiencing right now is a direct consequence of people congregating closely together in public and not taking the appropriate precautions. I mean, I would have been fine with those protests if people kept six feet apart, kept their masks on, and they took all the appropriate precautions. But you and I both know that didn't happen in all the cases. And likewise, I know it's summertime. We all love to go to the beach, uh, but having a, thousands of us jammed together in the beach is not a good idea. And we need to realize too, it could be a while before we got a vaccine. Uh, but for example, I think it's to our advantage uh, to maintain uh, sufficient uh, social distancing until we can come up with a therapy. As a scientist, I think we've got a much higher probability of coming up with some kind of therapeutic response to the virus uh, before we're going to come up with a vaccine. But hey, if we come up with a therapeutic response, say, in the next two or three months, that means we could really open up the economy again, because that would mean that if someone uh, got significant symptoms, we could give them treatment, which would immediately eliminate that. And to me, the scary thing about this virus are the long-term effects. There's growing evidence that after you recover, uh, there are effects that continue for many years, uh, organ damage, for example. So there's a lot of good reasons not to treat this virus lightly. This isn't just like the flu. Um, with the flu, you get over it and life goes back to normal. That may not be the case with this particular virus. And incidentally, uh, there are things we can do to stop this from happening in the future. I think one of the good things that's going to come out of this, we're going to realize there's a better way that we can manage our economy uh, to minimize the possibility these kinds of pandemics happening again. I mean, I've spoken on this before, that if we can simply avoid putting highly stressed, super crowded animals in contact with super stressed, highly crowded human beings, we're gonna minimize the possibility of a new virus uh, wrecking havoc upon the human species. And that's a relatively easy thing to do. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that it was certain wet markets uh, in China that gave birth to this virus. And uh, we could easily change that with having virtually zero effect on the economy. I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us. We had six open questions, which is always nice to end with some questions that weren't answered. If you are the author of one of those questions, please feel free to join us next week at 30, a little before we get started, and I'll make a priority to get those questions answered. Thank you, Hugh. Would you please close us in prayer? Sure. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of living in the 21st century when so much is being revealed to us through your book of nature. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take what we learn from the book of nature and use it to give people confidence in what you've revealed in the book of scripture. <clears throat> and Father, help us to share the reasons for our hope in Christ with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. May we always remember it's not just our words, but our demeanor that's going to help your Holy Spirit to penetrate hearts and bring them into a right relationship with you. And Lord, thank you that uh, you have 
made a new creation, a realm where we can go, where never again will we experience suffering, uh, never again will we experience evil, and we're going to be able to experience deep, rich fellowship with one another, uh, where love will be expressed and received to a degree that's beyond what any one of us can think or imagine. Lord, help us to hasten that time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Hugh. See you guys next week. All right. I'll stop the recording.